The Lord be with you. Good morning, everyone. I am Pastor Miguel, and it's great that you're here this morning. This is a, a 45 minutes to an hour of worship and praise. It's not just a time for us to be together, but it's the time to praise our Lord. I appreciate that you are still in the process of training your ear to my accent. I'm training my ear to your accent, too. So this is great. I think it's a completely fellowship, and we hope that our people online as well, they will be able to worship with us and see that today is the day of the Lord. So let us be welcome and praise. Will you please stand for the call to worship? This is the day the Lord has made, a day created for you to find peace and hope. So come, rest in the Lord. Let the demands of your week melt away in God's presence. Please be seated.
of pain, I choose love. In the midst of pain, sorrow falling down like rain, I await the sun again. I choose love. I choose love. I choose peace in the midst of war. Hate and anger keep in score. I will seek the good once more. I choose peace. I choose peace. Down, I will rise. When my world falls down, I will rise. When my world falls down, explanations can't be found. I will climb to holy ground. I will rise. I will rise in the midst of pain. I choose love in the midst of pain. I choose love in the midst of pain. Sorrowful. choose love. The Lord is always inviting us to pray for those who are in need, but also to share the joys that we have in our hearts. But at this time, I would like to share some of the joys and concerns that we have as the family of God. Andrea lives prays that her daughter's workplace is transitioning from red to yellow face with less COVID <coughs> patients. Prayers for Anne, who, had, who was in the hospital Tuesday morning with a kidney stone. Prayers for Nancy's family at the passing of her brother-in-law, Dave. Prayers for health concerns with Joanna. Continued praying prayers of a strength and comfort for Kay. Jack's funeral service will be here at Charlton on Tuesday at 11 a.m. So I invite you, I invite you to Pray at this time with all our hearts, minds, and souls. So let us pray. God, in the midst of everything, you are here among us. You are inviting us, O oh Lord, to gather and worship you and praise you. So we lift up the names that have been mentioned and many other names that are not listed at this time. We pray, O oh Lord, for those who are affected by the coronavirus. There's so many people, not just in our country, but around the world, that are hoping to have a vaccine or something that can help them to recover. We pray, O oh Lord, for those experiencing loneliness during this time of isolation. We know, Lord, how important it is to be connected with others and to see, O oh Lord, that you are in the midst of everything. But we pray also 
for racial tensions within our community and country. We have to be reminded over and over that we are one only creation that you love us and we are at your image. So we pray, O oh Lord, that we can see you, Jesus, in the other. We pray, O oh Lord, for God's power to expand our ability to love one another and to feel, O oh Lord, that no matter what, we are your children. What a beautiful time when you were with your disciples and they were asking you, O oh Lord, what should be the best way of praying? And you gathered them and you taught them this beautiful prayer that we will share all together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. from Paul's letter to the people of Ephesus. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power throughout his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, brother. Well, no longer strangers, and today we are entering to our fourth Sunday that we are talking about this letter of Paul to the church in Ephesus. And this letter uh, teaches the church how to be a community worthy of the gospel. Uh, so therefore, Paul writes this letter from uh, prison, uh, probably in Rome, to a congregation that he knows, but he probably doesn't know every single member of the church, and he writes this letter. And if you remember, Sunday, July the 12th, we were talking about the introductory prayer 
that Paul lifted up as a thanksgiving to the church in Ephesus. Today, we will also talk about prayer, but in a very different way. Today, we will talk about prayer uh, connected with love. So, let me begin this sermon with the following question. When do you pray? When do you pray? Take some seconds to reflect on that. And do you discover when do you pray? When? I'm not asking you why. When? So I don't have a clue about football, and I have shared this with you. Um, the only time that I was uh, in front of a big, a big stadium was uh, in 2014 when I had the blessing uh, by an, a special invitation from a, from a friend of mine who were colleagues. He's also a pastor, my brother Sean Smith, and he also was an alumni from Penn State. So he took me uh, to Beaver Stadium, and I saw one of these magnificent games of Penn State. If you're a Penn State fan, you can say we are and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, but the true thing is that um, uh, the stadium was packed, and I can tell you, I was amazed. I was amazed to see all this crowd of people having so much fun. But I also have to confess that I had so much fun by seeing people enjoying and having a good time. But I didn't understand a thing what they were doing. After some years, I still don't know anything about football, and I hope that you, some of you will have the time to teach me. And even somebody suggested me to buy a book called Football for Dummies, um, so maybe I will do it. Uh, however, one of the things that I learned uh, from my friend is that there is a, a specific expression that maybe you know, Hail Mary. And Hail Mary is, is, is when the quarterback throws the ball. Uh, me explaining this is kind of weird. But it is when the quarterback throws, throws the ball way down the field with only a few seconds left in the half or game. So with little chance of anyone to catch it in, catching it, it's called Hail Mary because it's a desperation it is a desperation play. Desperation play. So the expression is very interesting. I started investigating why this expression. And the story said that this expression came in 1930 as a famous Notre Dame player, Elmer Layden and Jim Crowley. And later they began using this expression, um, especially in Roman Catholic teams. And so the, uh, the player says that when he was playing um, against the Vikings, he closed his eyes. Look at that. He closed his eyes and he says, I close my eyes. And I'm sure that as he was throwing the ball and I said, and I said, Hail Mary. And the Hail Mary, when you have, it, it is when you have nothing, nothing else to do. And you have just a desperate desperation for an answer. So Hail Mary passed through the expression on the game. And let's be truthful. How much of this metaphor, how much of this metaphor comes real in our lives in time of prayer? How many times a lot of our believers, a lot of believers believe and understand prayer like this. The only time, the only pray is when they don't have any other option. Or they may have a routine prayer that they pray like meal times, like every Sunday when they come to church. But when it comes to seeking God with desperation, some people only do that when there is nothing. Nothing else to do. So imagine what means that. We are praying in a time of desperation. And it's interesting because Corey, Corey Tim Boom, this Dutch uh, Christian watchmaker who 
uh, along with his, her father and other family members helped many Jews escape from the Nazi Holocaust during the World War II. She, she had an expression, and I think that expression is quite interesting. It says, prayer is supposed to be the steer wheel, but not the spur tire. So, which means that prayer is not there for emergency only. Say, oh God, I need you, I need you. Okay, let us pray. No, that's not the point. The point is that we have to constantly pray. And if we go to the letter that our brother was reading for us this morning, I would like you to imagine Paul's situation when he writes this letter. Paul was miles and miles away from this church of Ephesus. And not only that, and he was in prison, so he writes this letter to the church. And perhaps, as I said before, Paul even didn't know the people. And he writes this letter. And it's a chapter about prayer. Now come back to my, my former question. Do you remember what I asked you for? When? When? When do you pray? When do you pray? Under which situation, under which circumstances do you pray? Or do you just, or do you just pray in the times of desperation? So Paul invites us to reflect. In this part, in this chapter, he is inviting us to reflect, how do you pray? And it is exciting for me as a parent and as a father to see my kids praying. For example, Franny. Franny, uh, when she has to pray for our meals, um, she used to uh, do something. She doesn't do it anymore as much as she did when she was a little one. But let me tell you, what's her rule? If the food that, that she's going to pray for is a good one and she likes it, <laughs> the prayer is going to be like this. It's like a thank you God for this food, amen, something like that. But it's on the table, we have some stuff that she probably doesn't like. A lot of veggies and things like that. Oh my goodness, she had long prayers, long prayers. And she was praying for many different things. But one of the things that I noticed that as, as Martin is growing, every time that Franny was praying, Martin just put his hands together and pray no matter what. So in our Bible reading this morning, in our Bible reading this morning, we notice that Paul doesn't take the traditional Jewish posture of standing and bow his head as he was praying. That was the way the Jewish normally pray. Standing up, bowing their heads, and just praying this way. But if you notice in the writing this morning, look at what it says. It says, for this reason... For the reason that he's praying for the congregation, I kneel before the Father. So it's interesting because he is not taking the regular position. He is on his knees. And a kneeling or laying down face to the ground, because this is what you do when you are praying, right? You are on your knees looking to the ground. And it's a posture that shows compassion. Complete dependence on God to meet those needs. And this morning I would like to invite you to see three main points very quickly. Three main points. The first, connected with the letter. The first is Paul prays for inner spiritual strength. You can say, okay, what is that? What is inner spiritual strength? Well, let me reread for you verse 16. It says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he, God, may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So my question is, how do you feel, how, how you felt spiritually exhausted? There are times when we feel spiritually exhausted. I asked somebody this morning, how are you doing? I said, she said, oh, I'm fine. Well, this is what we normally say. 
Because that's true. I mean, sometimes these words come out of our mouth without even thinking, right? It's just kind of a pattern. But sometimes in our lives, we are not spiritually fine. We may, we may feel helpless and we may feel that something is wrong. So what is Paul praying? He is praying for a healthy inner being. Paul needed a healthy inner person to deal with all of this as we need to feel spiritually healthy in our relationship with God and others. Our lives are not exception. We live in a constant external attack. Life is full of pressure and problems. If you tell me, oh, I don't have problems, I'm sorry, you're lying. We all have problems. We all have issues. We all have trials that we need to live. But Paul is telling them that in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those things, they need to find this special spiritual inner strength. So this is also an invitation for us as a Charlton United Methodist Church. The second point is Christ dwelling in your heart. Look at what it says, verse 17. It says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So notice this, so that. So that it means if you have a healthy, healthy connection, inner being, so what you will have then, your hearts will dwell in Christ. So Paul is not talking about salvation here. Paul is not talking about the union with Christ. He is talking about grace. And it's not a question about if Christ is in your life or not. But he says that Christ dwells in us. And when you see the, the Greek meaning of the word dwell, I like the meaning because it says that it's to live in a house. So what, I'm, what Paul is saying is that Christ needs to live in our house. What is our house? Our heart. So it's amazing that Paul is inviting us not just to have a healthy prayer life, but also is inviting us that Christ needs to be as a consequence of that healthy life in our hearts. The third one is comprehend the love of Christ. And today the prayer that Paul is talking about is mainly about love. It's mainly about love. So what happened with, when Christ settled down and is in your home, in your life? Listen to the next part of uh, verses 17 and 19. It says, I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may feel the measure of all the fullness of God. Here is another purpose statement. Here is another reason why Paul is on his knees. Do you see the progression? When you are strengthened with the Spirit and indwelled by Christ, the result is love. There's no other way. When you have a good connection in your, in your regular relationships and you have a healthy relationship, everything turns into love. So love is essential. And if you remember the situation of this congregation, they were fighting these two groups. Do you remember the two groups? The Judeo-Christians and the, the Gentiles? So imagine, Paul is telling them, you have to be strengthened in love and have a healthy relationship. Because by having a healthy relationship, you will dwell in, dwell, pray will dwell in you. And at the same time, Love will be the result. 
So what is next, brothers and sisters? Prayer is more than a desperate call. Prayer is more than just a posture. Prayer is the one that we need today, especially at this time when we have the COVID-19. And many people are desperate. We were just praying about the loneliness that many people feel because they are in their homes and they are not able to. Some of them are just looking at us here and worshiping with us through the screen. So we need desperately prayer, knowing that that brings love as a result. So the last word says, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And I would like to do an exercise for you today. When was the last time that we passed the peace? Many moons ago, right? Many moons ago. And peace is no other thing that offers love that dwells in our hearts. So I will invite you today to show signs of peace. We are not able to shake hands and hug and kiss, but we are able to bow to our neighbor to wave our hand to our neighbor and feel the presence of the Lord as we offer signs of peace. So I invite you to stand up and share together this moment of peace. These last several months have been difficult for many people. The daily news is consumed by counts of infections and death. People are isolated from family and friends. But behind the headlines are signs of hope. God's powerful love is at work all around us. College students going door to door to check in on people and to do their grocery shopping. Young children raising money to do acts of kindness for those working on the front lines. Neighbors checking in on those they know who are living alone. This is the love of God in action. Our offerings allow us as a church family to spread God's love in ways we cannot do alone. 
So let us now stand and sing praise to God for all our many blessings. all that we offer today, not only what we give of our money, but the offerings of our time and our talents. Bless the work of our hands and the intentions of our heart. May all we do, both as individuals and as a family of faith, be done to share your love with all the world. Amen. Christians by our love. So let us pray. God, you have invited us to have a feast, a feast of love, a feast of prayer, a feast of praise. So at this time, O oh Lord, as we prepare and we strength ourselves to go during the week and face many situations, we can remember, O oh Lord, that we have to have a healthy prayer life. That you can dwell in our hearts. So as an expression of that, we can continue loving others. So now, brothers and sisters, go out of this place. With the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.